Well, we have a real treat today, and I want to welcome out here to the stage a friend of mine that I hope you'll get to know better here, and we'll get to know better at City Life, and that is Evangelist Will Jones. Go ahead and give it up for him. Will was called by God out of a career in uh, professional basketball. And listen, if I was good enough to play professional basketball, it would, take, it, would take a, it would take a lot from God to get me out of that. But I love your heart, which was to reach people, to reach the one far from God. And he's doing that today all over the world through his ministry, Awakening Ministries. Uh, they do a lot of work overseas, a lot of work in South America, in Africa, reaching unreached people groups. In fact, we're going to be taking a couple missions trips together with Will and his team and his organization next year. And so we've got an interest meeting right after this service in the Thrive Room, and we would love to invite you to come over. It'll be brief, but we're going to give some information about three missions trips and opportunities we have next year. And so I hope you'll come over there and be a part of that. But Will, I just want you to know we're behind you. I love what you are doing to reach people. Uh, that's the heart of God. That's our heart as a church. And so thanks for being here. Give him a really warm City Life welcome one more time as he gets ready to share God's word. Well, man, I'm so, so excited to be here and share God's word with you uh, today. And just super thrilled as to how the Lord is going to speak to each and every one of us. And, uh, you know, one of the things I love being a part of is a great church that has a kingdom-minded culture. And uh, City Life is, thank you so much, City Life is a church of that caliber. And uh, you just got great leaders in Pastor Brad and Leah and the staff. I mean, could you just help me give them a big round of applause? I, I, I tell people... Uh, if, if you've got a pastor still here with you after COVID, that's a good pastor because <laughs> most of them wanted to run. A lot of them did run. Uh, a lot of them closed the doors. Uh, and God's just been so faithful to a, a great group of believers such as yourself and this leadership. And so uh, just a great church to be a part of. And, man, I'm like Starbucks espresso elated to share the gospel today with you and the word of God. And uh, I'm going to be talking about something that uh, many of you probably have heard of, many of you uh, probably love, many of you uh, may be introduced to at this moment today. And uh, one of the things I want to share with you is I I like to give kind of some analogies or comparisons, but it's not really any comparison to it. Uh, It's kind of like the cherry on top of the whipped cream and the milkshake. Okay, it's kind of like the jello with the pudding and the crust at the bottom, you know, some of those desserts. It's kind of like the icing on top of the cake. You just can't have too many cakes if it doesn't have icing on it, right? Or at least some type of glaze. Am I making you hungry? It's good if I am. Uh, but, but what I want to talk about today is kind of like that in some similarities, but not really. But if we could just compare it, it will be to something of that nature. And what I want to talk about is the gospel. The gospel. It's so good. It's the message of good news. And I want to remind you today as the scripture talks about reminding this group of believers that we're going to hear from and about in this book called 1 Corinthians. And it was a church that this man named Paul, who was called to be an apostle, uh, had started. And it was a bunch of believers in this church. And they were people that I like to say were broke, busted, and disgusted. Kind of like you and I. Don't be offended. It's just true. You know, Israel was God's chosen people, and they were stiff-necked and rebellious, the Bible called them. And so if they could be stiff-necked and rebellious, we could be robusted and disgusted. But at the same time, it was a group of people that loved Jesus, pursuing Jesus, but still had some problems, just like many of us do. And so Paul was like, I'm going to remind you of this glorious gospel. And so my goal today is to remind us of the first importance of what God was all about. I mean, if you think about the story of the gospel, you're going to hear it today. But if you think about it, it was God in his such strategic mind frame that he was able to send Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the sins of the world. Sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Even the Bible says it's a little foolish. But it's the most blessed, glorious message to mankind because 
Whenever there's good news, there's always bad news that precedes it. And so today, I want to preach to you for about three hours, 30 seconds, and some, no, I'm just teasing. Uh, many of you are like, I'm out of here, boss. Uh, but I want to talk on this thought, first importance, first importance. Uh, let me just read the scripture here as we jump in. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. It says, now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel, the gospel. That's what we're talking about today. The gospel I preach to you, which, I, which you received in which you stand, by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. He says, for I deliver to you as of what? First importance. What I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. Those three things that I just read, Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose, is the kind of summation of the gospel that this writer Paul is talking about here. And he says, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Cephas is Peter, actually. And he said this, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one ultimately born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, which simply means sent one. And he says, because, the reason why I am unworthy is because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I think some of us, I'm going to just pause there. I think some of us are going to get that revelation from God today. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I am who I am. I don't have to pretend to be somebody else. I don't have to try to fake to be somebody else. I don't have to think that I'm somebody else. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And he goes on to say this, this grace toward me was not in vain, but on the contrary, it worked, I worked harder than any of them, though I was not, though it was not I, but the grace that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Again, he was talking to this church about first importance. And as we think about this thought, first importance, I, I would say most of us do some things in our day, whether it be in the morning, during the early afternoon, in the evening. We do some things that are first to us, sometimes just by habit or ritual, and even subconsciously we do them. We do some things that are first to us, and, and in reality, those things are most important to us. This is just true. It's, it's our nature. Whenever I get up in the morning, one of the things I do before I even hit the ground is I say, thank you, Lord, for another day. That, that's just a first importance to me. But, but some of us, when we get up, uh, one of the other things I do is I kind of grab my phone because I use it as an alarm clock. And so I grab my phone and maybe cut on some Pandora or some Spotify or something like that. But some of us, we may get up in the morning and grab our cell phones first. We may play some music. We may look at the news we may look at a message the previous night that we got. We may check out social media. Some of us may grab a glass of water to rehydrate ourselves. Some of us may do like I did, just a simple quick prayer before I go into my extended prayer. Sometimes we brush our teeth. Don't forget to brush your tongue. That's of most importance. <laughs> Uh, sometimes we go get the kids up because we know they're a little slow getting up in the morning. We want them to get up well. Sometimes we say, man, I want to exercise. This is a first importance throughout my day somewhere. And a lot of us, we would tell, we, man, we give tithe. That's followers. We give our 10% of our income to God. That's first importance. We give off the top. Some of us, we love that Christian jug of choice, coffee. We go after that coffee drink first thing. We brew that coffee pot. And even when we get in the car, what's one of the first things you do? Seatbelt. Right? Why? Because we know that's important. Not just to the law so we don't get a click it or ticket ordeal, but also for our health and safety. And there are just things in our life that we do first, but if we really reflect on them, they're not really as important to God as they are to us. And that's kind of where the tension begins to, to build. 
Because there's some things in our lives that God is always calling us to reflect upon and remind us of, according to his word, that he wants to be of first importance in our life. But there is some tension there because a lot of times what's first important to him is not as important to us. And a lot of times what's important to us is not as first importance to him. And so today I want us to kind of unpack this scripture that we see in 1 Corinthians 15 because Paul's saying, hey, um, there's something of first importance to your life as a follower of Jesus. And what he tells them is, it's the gospel. And so he lets them know, I'm reminding you, my friends, brothers, sisters, I'm reminding you of the gospel. What, what, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Let's talk about the gospel. Let's talk about it. Because we know it's the good news of Jesus, but the gospel isn't just Christ died for us. The gospel isn't just God loves us. The gospel isn't just you know, Jesus rose from the dead. All those things are true and, and great, but the gospel, it's a full picture of what Christ did from the beginning of creation to what he's going to do at the end of consummation when Christ comes back to get all of his followers. And this gospel, it's good news, but again, remember what I told you, that it's also some bad news that precedes it. And this is this. It's God sent Jesus Christ, his son, into the world to live a perfect life. Why did he have to live a perfect life because you and I who are not perfect he gave his life on behalf of us you see God required something of us it's this word righteousness it means to be in right standing with God and none of us no humans the Bible tells us none of us are righteous we all are far from God we go our own way astray like sheep and so God sent Jesus into the world to live a life that we never could have lied and pay the price for our life that he did by dying on the cross, shedding his blood, rising from the dead three days later to give us now humanity an opportunity to have new life in Christ through the forgiveness of sins that Jesus could only pay for. So friends, as you can see, the bad news is that we're doomed by nature. The good news is there was a, a, a substitute that stepped in your place and my place and he bridged the gap from you to God and it's the cross which Jesus gave his life on. And so that's the good news. Now that we have this opportunity to have new life and have a relationship with the creator which we as his creation often falls astray by worshiping things that are created rather than the creator himself. And so Jesus brings us back to the creator. That's the good news of this gospel that Paul's talking about. It not only brings man into relationship with God, but when Jesus comes back one day, as you've been talking about the creeds of the gospel and the Bible, as Jesus comes back one day, he will also redeem humanity in its fullness. Even the earth will be the Lord's. That's what the scripture says. And so we now have this gospel that I love what Paul says, we are saved by it. That, that what, he's, what he's meaning is exactly what I just explained. You see, we're, the, the Bible tells us that the result of sin is death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. Meaning to be separated from a holy, loving, and perfect, but also just God. And so what that means is, now Jesus has done his work on the cross to save us from our sin that leads to death and destruction and eventually hell, which you talked about a couple weeks ago. This gospel saves us from the penalty and the power of sin. And so if I could tell anyone today, if you haven't received the gospel here or watching online and you're struggling with things in your life, it could be pornography, it could be bad relationships, it could be addictions. If you're struggling with those things, the gospel wants to save you from that and help you find purpose and destiny. So Paul's letting them know, I'm reminding you of this gospel which I preach to you. You see, the gospel is news. You want to know something about news? It always has to be communicated, whether it's written or it's verbal. And so Paul says, I, I preach this gospel. I shared with you this good news which you have received, and so therefore you're saved by it. But then he writes this other book called Ephesians to another church, kind of like Corinthians. And look what he says in Ephesians verse, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. He says, for by what? Grace. 
Grace simply means, friends, that you receive from God what you don't deserve. That's what it means. He says, for by grace you have been saved, meaning saved from the penalty and the power of sin. So he's telling this church, you've been saved by grace through faith. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So what is the faith? What is their faith in? Their faith is in Christ. Their faith is in what he has done for them, not what they can do for themselves. And so he goes on to say, you've been saved by grace through faith, and this is not of your own doing. I think we have to be reminded sometimes because we can go to church, we can tithe, we can give to kingdom builders, we can serve on a dream team, and all those things are great and needed, but it's not equated to salvation. Paul's letting us know, no, 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 you can't boast about being saved. You know why? Because he says it in the next verse. Listen to what he says. He says, it is the gift of God. Guess what that means, friends? We can do nothing to save ourselves. It all came from God. You didn't find God. Guess what? He found you. And it says, it is the gift of God, meaning it's a gift. It's a free gift. You can't earn this gift. You don't deserve this gift. That's grace. He gives you what you don't deserve. It's the gift of God, not as a result of your working, not as a result of what you think you did, not as a result of how you think you lived your life. And the reason why is so that no one can boast about it or be prideful about it. You know why? What, what, what would it look like if you went to heaven and you would say, hey, bro, what'd you do to get here? Well, you know, man, I gave this and I did this and I did this. And the lady said, well, girl, you know, I did. This. I used to bake and da, 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 all the cooking and stuff. You'd be boasting about what you did to get in God's presence and it would nullify what he did to get you there. And so he's letting us know the gospel saved us. We, we, we didn't save ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We're sinners in need of a Savior. That Savior came through Jesus Christ. So he says this gospel, it saves us. It is saving us. Then he says we are standing in it. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says this, not only the gospel which I preach to you, which you receive, then he says in which you stand. Standing in the gospel. We're standing in it. Well, what does that mean? I liken it to a foundation of a house or a building. I remember growing up, I grew up in the hood. I mean, wherever Philly, I remember the Will Smith, East Philly. Was that, oh, yeah, I'm just, I just, it just clicked to me. But, but I remember I grew up in this southern Illinois it was a place that was really rough, drugs, violence, crime, I mean, corruption, murders. It was, it was crazy. I grew up in this city. And I remember one of my friends, he lived in, in kind of a suburb area. I, I became friends with a guy. And his parents did well for themselves. And there was some building of houses in his neighborhood. And, and I was like, man, look at those houses. And, and I, I would see some with the wood coming up. And then the next phase, I would see it with the siding, kind of the insulation, I mean, coming into it. And then the siding would be applied. And I knew nothing about building a house, but I was always just ecstatic and, and, and loved to see how those houses would look on the exterior. And then think about what they would look like on the inside. Man, I wonder if it's going to have like granite tops. I wonder if there's going to be like a nice shower with stones in it or something. I wonder if the kitchen's going to have a conventional oven and all that. I mean, I grew up in a cooking family, so I'm just thinking about all the great assets and all the materials that would be in the house. And I remember one of my friend's dads, who was a construction guy, he said, hey, you know, Will, it's really cool looking at those houses, isn't it? And I said, yeah. I said, man, that's awesome. I said, I how, how does that house stand? He said, that's the most important question to ask. He said, that's the foundation of a home. He said, in, in reality, what, what that house is standing on, he said, it's dug as deep as it is that it stands up top. And he said, and then there's cement that covers that all the way up. And it's a slab that you see, but it goes way deeper. And he said, that, that's built as the foundation so that if anything were to begin to happen to that house, it, it wouldn't necessarily happen 
from the foundation more so just from the structure of it. But he said if the foundation is not proper, then that house is doomed if any storm or anything were to hit it. And I, and I remember this movie, it was a movie where this tornado came through this town. And I mean, it just wiped this town out. But there was a one house that was standing in that community after this catastrophic storm. And that house was actually a church, the house of God. And it reminded me of this particular scripture and what Paul's saying about being standing on it. What, what, what it reminded me of was this. It reminded me that when you're in Christ, the song says that he is the solid rock, the foundation on which I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And so what it means to be standing in the gospel is that Christ, the chief cornerstone on which the church was built through the gospel, that when you have a storm, you just won't stand in it. You with, will withstand the storm. That when life circumstances hit you, they won't just break you. They may bend you, but they won't break you because of the foundation that God has you on. And so when you think about standing in the gospel, friends, that song phrase is so pivotal. Christ, the solid rock on which I stand. All of the grounds, money, Achievement, success, fame, relationships, all those other grounds, they're like sinking sand. But Christ, the solid rock on which we stand, the gospel of Jesus sustains us. If your life is unstable right now, begin to think about where am I at in Christ? Is my life aligned with his life? Is my values of living aligned with his word? Because if it's not, you can't. Stand strong. If you are, you're probably standing on another foundation that eventually becomes sinking sand. And so Paul says that this gospel we're being saved by, we're standing in it. And then he goes on to say, in essence, we are sustained by it. This sustained word means it, it, it provides sustenance. And another word to look at it would be nourishment. And I love what he says in Romans 5, 1 and 2. Let, let's read Romans 5, 1 and 2. He says, therefore, since we have been justified, let me just explain that to you really quick. That, remember what I was telling you about the gospel and how that word justified means that God now looks at you. He's the judge, so he's just. And he looks at you when you're in Christ just as if you never sinned. Justified. And so when you have something in the courtroom and you're being brought before a judge and, you, and, and, and his job is to either acquit you or to charge you. So he is the just one that has the ability to do that by the law. And so he can do that. God is basically saying, I justified you because of Christ. So he says, therefore, since we have been justified by what? By faith, meaning faith in Christ, who he is, what he's done, not ours. By faith, we have peace. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Not through you, not through your job, not through your 401k, 3B, not through your retirement plan, not through anything that you've done. It's only through Jesus Christ that we have sustenance, that we are being sustained as followers of Jesus. So Paul's just reminding this church that gospel in which I preach to you, you received it, you're saved, you're standing in it in which you stand. He says you're being saved by it. I love that because that's, that's the word of sustenance. It's, it's a continuum. It's a continuation. It, it, it helps us to understand that we're not saved once, but we're saved once and for all. And the gospel continues to sustain us through this process if we hold fast to it. And so, friends, I want to help you understand that Paul doesn't stop there. Sometimes I think if, if we're not careful, we'll believe and we'll begin to think that other things in our lives are really our true substance. Or really what we think sustains us. And remember what Jesus said in this outline of the Lord's Prayer. He said this, give us our what? Daily bread. I, I thought it was interesting that Jesus never said give us our weekly bread. Give us our monthly bread. Give us our annual bread. Because in reality, that's how we think. We plan to live for the future. But he said, no, 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 no. Daily. 
And in another verse in Psalms, it talks about the unpacking of that. Why, why ask for daily? Because sometimes we get so focused on everything else that we begin to store up things on earth and those things become our God. And so he was reminding them and that daily is, hey, I want you to live by faith daily. God, give us our daily sustenance for living. And so, friends, I, I, I want to remind you that in this process, we have to be so focused and centered on God and Christ being the center of all of who we are, but also the provision that we live by. Listen to what this same writer Paul says in Galatians 20, chapter 2 through chapter 3, verse 5. Listen to what he says. He says, I have been crucified. <laughs> I love that. That's that's some really explicit language. He said, I have been crucified. Now, we know Jesus was the only one that was crucified. But what he's saying is, my life is mirroring his. If he was crucified, I've been crucified. That means everything about me is dead. All of my desires that are ungodly, that are worldly, dead. All of my wants, dead. All of my passions that are undesired, that are ungodly, dead. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. He says, for it is I who no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. Friends, this is the centrality of the gospel, what I'm telling you about. When you receive Jesus Christ and you've been saved by the gospel and you're standing on the gospel and it's becoming your substance for living, he says, Paul helps us to understand it. He says, it's not me who lives anymore, but it's Christ in me who's living through me. That's why I always remind people, Christ is not as much as concerned about what he wants to do through you before what he wants to do in you. What he does through you is really a result of what he's doing in you. And so Paul's saying, uh, it's not I who live anymore, it's Christ who live in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And this is what he says. I do not nullify, meaning I don't make this in vain of what Christ has done for me by the grace of God for the righteousness. For if where righteousness were, he goes on to say this, through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This is what he means by that. If you were responsible for obtaining the righteousness of God through your works, through how you live, through your discipline, through your meditation, then Christ died for nothing. That's what he's saying right there. He says, Christ died for no purpose. And he calls them foolish because this group of people in the Galatian church, they had got back to thinking about the law and how they could carry out the law in their life. And Paul was reminding them, no, man, you're crazy. You're sinful by nature. You can never please God. doesn't matter how hard you try, how much you fast, how much you're disciplined. You can't do it. And this is what he says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has switched your thinking? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Then he says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? What he's, at, what he's letting them know, friends, is it's Christ who sustains you, not your own working, not your own doing, not your own performing. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ who sustains you. So he lets us know we're saved by it. We're standing in it. We're sustained by it. But this is the greatest part that I love to share. And this is why I want to camp out at for the rest of our time. We are sharers of it. We're sharers of it. And that's where most of us get a little uncomfortable. Get a little wiggly. Because it's true. It's like, man, I need to share this message. Like, well, what about when somebody doesn't want to hear it? What about when somebody's so far from God, I don't even have to think about it. I can see it. I can hear it. They're just far from God. Why would I even share this message? Why would I even tell them about what Jesus has done and how much he loves them? But Paul helps us to understand that we're stewards of this message. We're, we're to be sharers of it. And the reality of it is this, friends. I mean, I think the Philadelphia Eagles play today. Against the New Orleans Saints. Big game here, right? And most of us are going to be sharing about that game in some aspect. 
aren't we? Most of us, I mean, ladies, we love our soap operas and our favorite TV shows. Guys, we love, I mean, deer hunting was big across the U.S. Some of us may be deer hunters here. I don't know. I mean, we always are sharing something, our favorite food, our favorite restaurant, our favorite recipe. We're always sharing something. But is it of first importance what we're sharing? Is it, is it have eternal value? Doesn't mean we don't share things that doesn't, but what Paul's saying is let's, let's focus on what's first of importance. Well, we're sharers of this message. And let me look at 1 Corinthians 15, 11. This is the same chapter. He says this kind of toward the end. He says this. He says, whether then it was I or they, meaning that the grace of God was using us to preach the gospel, he said, we preached. And so people believed. Can I help you understand something? No one could ever believe without someone preaching. If you don't believe me, go read Romans 10, 17 through 20. Let me just back up 10, 10 through 20. No one could ever believe in Jesus without someone communicating to them, whether that's written, verbal, braille, whatever it would be. It's impossible. The gospel has to be communicated. That's the medium that Christ has set forth since the beginning of time. And so Paul's letting them know here, listen, we're to be sharers of this gospel. He goes on in 2 Corinthians, the same book. It's an extended book, but it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Listen to what it says, friends. Just check this out. The word is so awesome. Listen to this. He says, all this is from God. What is all of this? All of this is the gospel. He's explaining about this glorious thing that God did through his son, Jesus Christ. And he says, all of this is from God. Remember what I told you. We can't save ourselves. Don't act like it. Don't try it. We can't. He says, all of this is from God. And this is what he's explaining. This is what God did. Who through Christ. Again, that lets us know it's not through you. It's not through me. It's not through my Uncle Joe. It's not through my big mama. It's not through my cousin. It's not through my teacher. It's through Christ who has reconciled us. Now, let me unpack this word really quick because it's used in a lot of phrases today. Reconcile basically means biblical reconciliation is to, to bring back to harmony what has been broken. What that means is God had a relationship with man in the beginning, but sin entered the heart of man and caused man and God to be separate due to sin. And so this is what God is saying. This is the gospel. Through Christ, he's brought man back into harmony with himself. That's what he says. I'm reconciling things to myself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, Paul wasn't just talking about the Corinthian church. The Bible is also meant for you and I. And so don't ever, 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 ever say that you're not called to ministry because you're lying to yourself. We are. Each and every one of us have been given this ministry of reconciliation, meaning given the ministry of proclaiming Christ to people. L let's go on to see what he says there in verse 19. I want to read that to you. Verse 19, he says, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them. What, what he means there is God wasn't counting your sins against you. Why? Because he loved you so much. This is John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave. Friends, I want to tell you something. Whenever somebody tells me they love me, I'm like, show me. Because love is an action word. God gave his son Jesus. He gave him an action so that he can be a substitute for the world. Meaning he stood in your place and my place and took the sins and the penalty of death on his hand and God raised him from the dead because he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I sinners may become righteous in God's eyes. This is good news. And it says God was doing this through Christ to bring the world back to himself. The Psalms tells us that, 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 that God will have every nation worshiping him. It doesn't matter what tribe, tongue, or people group you come from. Every nation will worship God. God wants all of creation to worship him. That is the good news. Can I just preach for a moment? I want to help us understand something. Friends, this glorious gospel is the gospel that will save a crackhead and make them a preacher. This glorious gospel that will take a money swindler and make them an elder or a deacon in the church. This glorious gospel will change some one's lives and if it has changed yours we are entitled to be sharers of it we're obligated to be sharers of it 
your school, friends, schoolmates, teammates, colleagues, family, friends. What if we could be a body of believers here? This, this, this church, city, like what if we could be a body to say, man, I'm going to own my neighborhood. There's not going to be a person who doesn't know about Jesus on my block. I'm going to own my department at the store that I work in. I don't have to be a manager. I'm going to own my grade. If I'm in a high school or middle school, every student are going to know about Jesus because the Holy Spirit in me is going to give me the ability and the creativity to be a sharer of this message. Friends, what if we would live our lives that way of first importance? I'll help you to understand what will happen world will be changed will be changed because the kingdom of God will grow the world won't necessarily become how we would want it to look but it'll be changed because the kingdom will advance because one day the king he is coming back and he'll establish a kingdom on earth with all of those who have submitted their lives the rule and the reign under his lordship And so I want to let you know today we're to be sharers of this gospel. And maybe you're here or watching online and you have not yet partake or took of the gospel. Maybe you haven't received it yet. Can I give you an opportunity to do that? I told you all about Jesus. Life, death, burial, resurrection. It was all for you. If you're out of relationship with God today, Jesus wants to bring you back into relationship with him. And it's as simple as A, B, C. A, admit that you're separated from him because of the life you're living. B, believe that he died on the cross for your sins that separate you from a holy, loving, and perfect God in a relationship with him. And believe that he rose from the dead to give you new life as you would confess, C, your sins to him and make him Lord of your life. So if you're here today, if you're watching online, would you be so bold to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I'm a mess, but he's a God of specialty and mess because he makes messes out of miracles. If you're here today, friends, you would say, I want to come to Jesus. Or I need to come back. I walked away. If you're online, I need to come back. Stop driving your car, pause on the couch, whatever you're doing, and let's make a moment between you and God to encounter him. And so if you want to give your life to Jesus today and you say, Will, I'm making that commitment. When I count to three, just give me an indication by hand raised, that's me, that's me. If that's online, just type, that's me, that's me, that's me. If that's you, one, two, three. I want to give my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, come on, sit there. Come on, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love this. I love this, friends. Thank you, thank you, thank you online. Thank you, thank you. Listen, I don't just thank you. I'm thanking you as a spokesman for Jesus today because it says this. The moment you want to give your life to Jesus, yeah, he comes into your heart. He begins to give you the peace that you're going to need to live this life. He begins to create that foundation of sustenance in you so that you can walk and live with him. And so friends, if you raised your hand, this is the best decision you could ever make. I promise you, the best decision. And so if you lift your hands, can we just pray this together as one body? And let me just invite you to stand with me if you're able as we get ready to close out our time. If you raised your hand, let's pray this as as a church together to welcome those who are saying, I want to follow Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin, for rising from the dead, and giving me an opportunity to put my trust in you. I believe in the work of Jesus, and today I turn away from a life of sin, and I embrace the new life that you give me. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Come on, City Life, give it up one more time. Listen, listen, I love it. This is awesome. 